Yeah, I think I'm up. Thanks, buddy. Right. Appreciate it. Thanks again, everyone who came out. Um, thanks, Josh. Thanks, Blue Cadet. Thanks to the Center of Architecture for hosting us. Uh, I am Chris Christman, and here we go. So, um, this is supposed to be about reality. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit or a lot about my reality, and um, kind of my, I'm going to start with my history and try and dive and move as fast as we can. I told Josh a couple nights ago that it was gonna be 45 minutes and his eyes got really big, so I'm going to go a little bit faster than that. So, I am a guy from northwestern part of Pennsylvania. Uh, I grew up outside of a town uh, called Titusville. It's kind of famous, uh, not anymore, maybe it was before. But um, I didn't live in the town, I lived in the country outside of the town. And a defining characteristic for me was having a bathtub, and the idea that when, you, when I say bathtub, it's, it's like that, uh, the cool bathtubs that you have in your house when you have two or three other showers. We just had the bathtub, so I grew up without a shower, so maybe that defines how kind of country I'm, I'm coming from. Now, we, we didn't have a, we had the bath, um, but we also had a crick. When, and everyone knows that as a creek, but that can kind of speak to the language of where I'm from. <laughs> So we heated our house uh, with a wood-burning stove, and the wood was cut by my family and I. Um, my family, I, I was just along for the ride, really. Um, we managed a, a, a big property uh, adjoining to our property, and they would log that every 10 years or so, and then we would cut down and saw and chainsaw these tree tops, and that would heat our home. So um, we were very sustainable, I guess uh, you could say. But I was driving a tractor and uh, running a chainsaw by age 10. So again, very, very country reality for me. So um, I'm also an only child, functionally speaking. And um, when you live in the country with tons of space and two constantly working parents and no neighborhood children, there's a whole lot of independent play. Um, my childhood was an incubator for creativity. So in a situation like this, you're likely to create many, many storylines. So day to day for me was just running around the land and, and with a couple dogs and creating these weird missions. And you know, uh, it was a whole lot of, like I said, independent time and, and really an amazing environment to grow, around, grow up around. So I'll jump ahead a bit. Um, this is me, kind of looks like me. Um, as you can tell by me now, or maybe that picture, I wasn't a very uh, athletic or physically gifted child. Um, so, uh, I was so bad, uh, it took me two years to learn how to play kick back and forth. For two years, I could not kick a ball forward. I would always kick it back over my head. So, you know, I, I just, <laughs> it was always a little bit of a struggle. So being bad at, at sports was a really strong motivator for me. I wanted to be great and I wanted to be good at all kinds of stuff, uh, specifically sports. Um, and we'll get into that as we go. So one day I'm out in the woods with my dad. I think I was about 14. We're cutting wood and um, my dad thought it was a good idea to introduce me to throwing a stick. So um, it was a big stick, and what he was really getting at was the idea of throwing a javelin. And um, so when you live in the country and you have tons of space, you obviously are most likely are going to have a huge yard. So uh, as I kind of somehow got into this strange sport uh, of throwing a stick or throwing a javelin, um, I had this major space to practice in. So that was kind of ideal for my, uh, my development here. Um, so. Javelin, as you can imagine, is a really simple sport. You run down a lane, you throw a stick, um, and practicing it isn't too much different. You run, you throw the stick, you walk after the stick, and you get the stick, and you walk back. So <laughs> um, it, it, it is a little monotonous, but it was my thing. So uh, practicing the javelin and, and really kind of owning it and loving it and being passionate about it is what brought me to Philadelphia and brought me to the University of Pennsylvania. So 
Um, I'll get there with the photography. Trust, st stick with me a little longer. So sports helped me create an identity. And the javelin for me was, it was, it was everything. It was my passion and everything I was trying to do, and I wanted to be great at that. Um, for a small town kid with a small town education who was making a jump to a place like Penn, spending all of my time focused on the javelin was an awful idea. So I really did struggle for quite a while at Penn, and then I found photography. So again, I, I wanted to be really great. I wanted to be special with the javelin, and it created overtraining. Um, I had four surgeries, uh, kind of ruined my body, and at the same time that that happened, I, when I had to give that up, uh, I was finding photography and I was able to transition and shift my passion for the javelin into photography. So um, I, guess, I guess what I'm getting at is that idea like spending so much time on something you love and your passions. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about uh, 10,000 hours as, as a, you know, a time to hone a craft. Uh, perfect, perfect a craft, master craft, something in that ballpark. I don't know that I've mastered it, but um, I've certainly put in my 10,000 hours. So, um, you should have a really solid sense of my personal history. Um, I don't think you came here to hear that, but we'll talk about some pictures. Um, so, so, a few takeaways here. Um, what brought me to what, you know, that, that brought me here. Um, the real ideas. Um, that brought me to the camera. So um, my takeaway would be focusing on what you love and, and really you know, honing in on that and the idea of working in a cave. So not literally working in a cave, obviously. You will need Wi-Fi in your, in your adventure, uh, but the metaphorical cave. So when I graduated, I, um, I kind of removed myself from a lot of my relationships and my friendships and, and people around me and, and really, really honed in on photography. Um, I worked uh, for a local photographer who's in attendance today, Dave Moser. Uh, I worked for another photographer at the same time and, and was just totally, totally uh, enveloped by the work. Um, I think it's really great uh, that you're for some period of time, whether it's now or later, or if you're making a big shift in your life, that you use your time, which is the greatest resource. And you know that's what I did. I used all of it for photography. I used all of my money. I moved out of Philadelphia to Maniunk into a literal shoebox. I think it was a 60 square foot room. And I moved in with people I'd never met with intention uh, to just, just kind of isolate myself in my work. Um, and I spent those two years really, really making that transition from maybe someday I can be a photographer to shooting full time and, uh, and doing kind of living out, starting to live out my dreams. So I'm going to run through some work now. I really want to talk about the evolution of my work and my team's work um, and how it makes sense that um, kind of all the things we do and how well related they are. So I talked about home a lot, and the, and the work at home is so important for me because it, it, was, it was me shooting and being connected to what I was familiar with, and that was my platform or my stepping stone for my whole career. So I started with a familiar. I started with the woods. Um, you know, I talked about cutting, cutting the wood, and uh, honestly, this is about 20 feet from where I first uh, threw the javelin. So I was focused when I started on landscapes and spaces and being outside and seeing really big, big, big ideas through landscapes. So that was honestly my first two or three years of photography. I, I loved and I still do love shooting these massive vistas and wide open spaces. Um, I was, was and, and honestly still do, I'm trying to capture not what a place looks like, but how I feel or how I felt when I was there. So it's more about the experience than it is about documentation or uh, you know, selling you on a trip. <laughs> so from the landscapes, <coughs> um, it's, it's really this idea of a bigger space with detail throughout the entire scene. And 
again, it's really there to help you envision the experience. From the landscape work, um, I ventured into ph photographing people. And really, that was the normal step, was a progression from big spaces to people in big spaces. So uh, this is my environmental portraiture. Uh, sometimes I like to call it landscape portraiture, just to really speak to that jump. Um, there's usually a hero situated in a complex scene or space. Um, you know, I think we as people are supremely influenced by our environments. Um, whether we admit it or not, they play a massive role in who we are and, and, and where we come from. And whether it was an environment from your childhood or an environment during some formative years or where you're at right then, the space matters. So sometimes the spaces aren't that large, but I often try to make them so. And I think that, you know, that comes down to a lot of camera work and some compositional elements. Um, this is Heather from Kensington Quarters. She could not be with us today. Uh, her husband, Brad, is out there somewhere. Thanks for joining us. Um, so she's our butcher. Uh, this is a first picture in a series I'm working on right now called Women's Work. And they're archetypal um, portraits of people in their place. And the heroes in this project are women who are su succeeding in professions that are uh, traditionally dominated by men. Here's Nancy Pulley from Stryker Farms from the same project. Here's Christine from St. Benjamin's Brewery. She's the brewer. Here's Ali Goldblum. She's a <laughs> good chair, good work. Uh, she's uh, Josh's wife, actually. <laughs> so <laughs> if anyone has recommendations for this project, we're like really knee deep in it. Um, you can see more of the work on our site. But if you have suggestions, we're, we're really, really loving what we're doing right now. And we think it's going to be something cool as it comes together. So if you have suggestions, please see me. So um, now, all that work is personal work. Here's something from uh, an actual commercial campaign for Intuit with QuickBooks. And you know, this isn't women's work, but it really is women's work. This is a real beekeeper, and this is a real scene. And, and, and one thing that I like to kind of drive home is that idea that the work that I'm doing for myself really parallels the work that we're doing for other people, and that there's an identity and a style to the work. Uh, you'll see in different, different types of work that there's very similar elements that transcend all of it. So again, environmental portraiture is just an extension of, of landscapes of spaces with heroes in them. These are the Burley Brothers, the um, Shane's Confectionery and Shane Candy's Guides downtown. So. <clears throat> With the majority of work you're seeing, uh, there's some representation of reality. Uh, I'm using some kind of complex methods to depict and tell a bigger story that may exist on the surface, but there's, there's a portrayal or a representation at the center of it. Here's my gunsmith. This is another Titusville thing for me. And again, um, starting at the root or starting at home has been such a big part of what I do. Um, one thing I wanted to say really quick, I'm at 13 minutes. So when portrayal, <laughs> uh, when I say portrayal, I don't mean documentary. Um, I think they're two really specifically different ideas. I don't think that either one is really the truth. I think security cameras are kind of the truth. But besides that, um, I, I think all photography is, is you're kind of lying. Um, maybe it was a strange, uh, I, I really battled with this idea of reality. Uh, Josh was talking to me about representing magic, possibly, but I thought reality was a little bit better because, you know, I think all of our realities are subjective and how I want to look at the world is mine and that's what I'm here showing you. So, so from environmental portraiture, it's a pretty simple jump to go to studio portraiture. So you're essentially taking, uh, taking these people out of these complex situations, working in a more uh, controlled lighting situation. You're removing the context um, or the bigger story that the space might create. Uh, and then, again, just uh, removing some of the bigger story with the, with the spaces. So a lot of times we don't have the luxury of going and shooting everyone on location. I think there is certainly a little more reality to those ideas, um, but the, com the complexity of what we do, we just, we, we just can't always be there to do this thing. It also opens up a creative path um, for what we do. 
And um, as you may have imagined, uh, we often shoot some things in the studio and then compare or composite them with scenes uh, that are, you know, we are hand shot somewhere else and then handled in digital post. So with that in mind, a reasonable jump from complex landscapes and a variety of portraiture, both indoors and outdoors, is conceptual portrait portraiture. What that means to me is the idea that I'm further removing re uh, the identity of these people and then some of that context which they exist and I'm creating a new story or my own reality uh, with these images and not worrying about staying true to any certain truth. So while we're talking about it, the, uh, a lot of the spaces themselves are ideas that I'm creating or my team and I are creating and it's not necessarily a real experience space or a real existing space, but it's something that we, you know, we derive ourselves. And, and a lot of it, again, goes back to the idea of how you feel in a place. When I made the jump uh, to the conceptual work, I think a really simple jump from there is the idea of rem removing any sort of real story or true identity about this one person or any given person. And that next logical step is lifestyle photography. Um, certainly a commercial step, uh, but it's, it's that idea that these people don't have a I defined identity, but they're intended to represent an achievable set of realities that you may or may not wish to aspire to. So hopefully you're getting a good sense of all of this work and all of these types of work really are pretty well connected. And also you can kind of see the, hopefully, the development of my work and, and the career and the varied assembled teams that I've worked with. And, and you can see how a style and an idea and a vision can transcend all these types of work. So, some takeaways, when you focus on one idea and you do it until you get it right, it's going to become easier to make the next big leap. He did not leap. <laughs> That's David Karp. He founded uh, Tumblr. There's actually another roof about three feet below what you can see in the frame, so don't worry. <clears throat> After you establish your identity, don't work in a cave. Build a team, have collaborators, get feedback, try stuff and share stuff. You know, make a squad, find conspirators. I, th I think the, the biggest thing for me has been, and the biggest jumps in my career, is when I was able to sign away some parts of what I do. Um, the, the identity should be clear throughout. The, the style is defined, uh, but having extra hands and having people help create that work and establish that work only makes you better. That said, don't wear all the hats if you can avoid it, but do understand how they all fit. So when I started, I was the photographer. I was never that person in that photo. Uh, I was the marketer, I was the salesman, I was the bookkeeper, I was the studio manager, I was the accountant, um, I was the equipment manager, I was the, like everything, kind of, kind of having all those pieces. Um, you don't have to be all the roles, and I think that that's true for all businesses. Um, you need to know how all of them work though. Be grateful. Every day, I can't avoid thinking of ways that my situation or a team situation uh, could be more ideal. At the end of the day, it's a little bit silly. I have surpassed every goal that I set out to achieve, and now we're on to a new set of goals, and a lot of those take in a lot more people than just me. Um, I get to work with great people all the time, day in, day out, and we're you know, establishing a reality that is truly ours and truly mine, uh, and I get to share that with the world, so that's pretty amazing. So what are the realities of what we've done and what we're asked to do? So sometimes we have to work very fast. And judging by the time, I'm going to have to move very fast. Uh, sometimes we only have moments. 
to work with people. 10 minutes, eight minutes with very defined goals, uh, very kind of rigid outlines of what we're making and what we're doing. And sometimes we have to work really fast and really for a long time. So the idea of that being, <laughs> Uh, we have to move incredibly, incredibly fast, but somehow still pull off uh, making, you know, something like 80 pictures in a day. Uh, now, obviously, <laughs> some of these are making a jump after the camera, uh, but, you know, capturing assets, it really comes down to a lot of pre-production, a lot of fantastic production, and being organized and, and pulling together a plan. Sometimes we have to work very slow, but for a long time. Um, you can see what happens in post here. This is a, one of four pictures that we spent about a month working on. We did uh, over 100 shoots in, in yeah, just under a month to just create, I say just, but uh, to create four pictures. This was a, a tourism campaign for San Antonio. So you can see we shot every one of these elements uh, and the idea of how much planning it would take to make it all work, make it all blend, tell a big story, and then make that, <laughs> make that fit all of the restrictions that our clients had for us. So sometimes we work very closely to represent reality and very close to the idea of documentation. And then sometimes uh, we're fortunate enough to make our own worlds and create our own realities. I would love to explain every one of the pictures, but with the time lim limitations, if anyone has any specific questions, we can talk afterwards. So what kind of reality does my profession create? And here's some of the fun stuff without any of the dead air. So, big reality takeaways. Here they are. Your reactions, interactions matter, and every time I'm making a picture of a person, I'm trying to make the best picture of that person that's ever been made. People, places, and things are, peop are people too. So, um, I know this is really subjective, uh, but it's, trying, it's something I'm trying to establish on every shoot. It sets up a pretty lofty goal, and no, I know that in some cases I can't, you know, it's just not achievable. But we're trying to make special things and make from where we're sitting and where we're standing, make a real impact and leave something that lasts. 
So, and I think probably you're getting this, but um, I am we. And, and a lot of times when I talk about my, about my work, I talk about our work. Um, I can't do it by myself. Uh, we do big ideas and we do very complex things. And I am, uh, I am a piece of that, but there are also a lot of people that are very, very important to that. And we couldn't do it without them. So <laughs> no job is as glamorous as the individuals <laughs> would lead you to believe. Um, there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of dead air. And there's a lot of disappointment with any profession. And mine has that too. And reality is subjective, but it's malleable. And if you want to reshape it, you have to use your own hands. So I think this was my biggest takeaway, is that um, we kind of forget how much time we're going to spend with work and how much time, you know, how, what a big part of that day is and that week is and that month and year and decades. So you're going to spend 100,000 hours if you're possibly fortunate enough to, uh, that's subjective. So <laughs> try to make that time spent very special. Work with special people and make working <clears throat> with you a special experience. All right, everyone. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed it.